844-500-4242. I actually think it was Shug that put him in the outhouse, but that's okay. I I need uh, I need some uh, I, I need some atomic dog to make up for that. I'll get working on it. Why must I chase the cat? Why must I chase the cat? All right, so it's time now for masterpiece theater. We haven't done. That. This isn't one of the longer ones we'll have, but I think I mentioned this yesterday. I was uh, I, I did a uh, I did a Fox and Friends at six fifteen, and then I had to go over to uh, to have my elbow looked at by the orthopedic surgeon. So I had like an hour to kill at Newton Wellesley Hospital, and so I'm just in the lobby and I'm going through the magazines, and so I pick up a couple of New York New Yorkers, and I find a story in there. One of them is entitled "The Return of the Native." A British immigrant leaves Trump's America by Rebecca Mead. And I said, oh, this will be rich. So I started reading it, and it was everything I expected it to be. And, you know, it really has to be has to be read, though, by somebody in a British accent, in a female British accent. And I thought, I thought about doing it myself, and then I realized that was the way to go. So it's time now for Grace to assume the persona of Rebecca Mead. And she's trying to, if you, I hope you're, uh, if you're still watching it on the camera, she's got like a little glass. She's doing, she's doing some, having some tea. And she's got a little, she's got a little black pug with her, just like the Duke and Duchess of Windsor used to have. So Rebecca, are you, are you ready for your, uh, your star turn here? Mm-hmm. All right. Okay, so I, there are four sections here. That the, It's an interminable story, but I thought four sections would suffice. The four most snooty, snobbish, virtue-signaling sections there were, and believe me, there are a lot of them. Uh, Rebecca Mead, the British immigrant leaving Trump's America, begins her opus with a very, very special missive that she once received. I have been thinking lately about a letter that I received from President Barack Obama in the fall of 2011. In it, he offered me his congratulations and praised my determination in terms that were deeply gratifying, if (laughs) a little over the top. He told me that I represent the promise of the American dream. Of course, it wasn't a personal letter. The signature at the bottom was a facsimile. It was addressed to me with a salutation that I hadn't received before. Dear fellow American. How much of a name dropper is she? That's the, first, that's, the, that's the lead right there. A letter from Barack Obama. Did I ever mention to you that I, I get a letter from Donald Trump every couple of weeks? He's asking me for money. I get letters I, from Elizabeth <laughs> Warren and Kamala Harris and Beto <laughs> O'Rourke. Bernie Sanders has even sent me a few letters. Right, right. Okay, so, so you know, she, she comes to love her adopted land, and nothing could ever make our gal leave her beloved Big Apple homeland and to return to Old Blighty. Nothing except something very, very terrible. The terrible thing, the unspecified, unimaginable thing that I used to say could dislodge me from America finally happened. And not to me alone, but to the country itself. I'm not leaving because of Trump, but I'm not not leaving because of him either. The day after the 2016 election, George and I dropped our son off at school, and we walked in endless, shocked circles around the park at the end of our street. We saw friends and embraced them with few words, in tears. It was as if everyone were in mourning. We could leave, George and I began to whisper to each other. Should we leave? When will we know whether we should or not? When might it be too late? Yet how many friends, when I have told them of my plans, have replied that they wished they could do something similar? Almost everyone. It was almost as if everyone was in mourning. Were you in mourning, Grace? I don't believe you were. I was. I know I wasn't in mourning. I don't know who this quit, Grace I was is. Say, quit trying to break her out of character, Howie. And, Come on. And, this thing, when it might be too late to leave the country. And I'm I wasn't aware American that the passport. borders had been closed. Hey, we're building <laughs> walls to keep people in. <laughs> okay. Handmaid's Tale. Yes. Okay. So 
you know, but Rebecca Mead is willing to concede that not everything is perfect in the United Kingdom. And in certain areas, in fact, it's very, very Trumpian. I am under no illusions that the UK is a beacon of progressivism. This is a move from the fire into the frying pan at best. The Brexit vote, which took place five months before Trump's election, was a harbinger and not an aberration, and has encouraged hostility toward perceived outsiders. There are a couple of words I don't use very often in my daily life. Dislodge and harbinger. Just Those are just a... Those are just a couple of them. But but then again, I don't come from old blighty like you do, Rebecca. But, you know, despite everything, this is the last this is the last cut. Rebecca is trying to keep keep a traditionally English stiff upper lip. I hope that, in spite of the ugliness unleashed by Brexit and the ongoing chaos of its implementation, Living in London will provide some relief from the sense of oppression that descended on the U.S. during the campaign of 2016, in which Donald Trump established an America, American rhetoric very much different from the one I had aligned myself with, and which only worsened since the election, as he continues to debase the office of the presidency. Britain feels like a calmer place, if only because when you wake up in the morning, there are still four or five hours to go before Trump starts tweeting. By moving to Europe, I'm not escaping from the realities of resurgent nationalism. In Hungary, Viktor Orban has already built a wall to keep out the refugees, and nationalist movements are thriving in France, Italy, and elsewhere. Nor does the influence of the President of the United States stop at the country's borders. We all live in a time as much as we live in a place, and this is a time when demagoguery and nativism, like sea levels, are everywhere on the rise. That's a great kicker. Has has she apologized for uh, UK citizen Christopher Steele's attempts to rig a presidential election? She would never do that because she's in the throes of resurgent nationalism. I bid you good day. And the oppression. Oppression. The oppression in the United States of America. People are so damn depressed here. Hip, hip, chip, chitty-o. How many Democrats and political enemies and journalists have been locked up in the last two years? What's the count at now? I like it. I like the fact that he's he he speaks in rhetoric that's very different than she's been come to than she's come to you know enjoy. You know, you mean like if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor, or if they bring a if they bring a knife, we bring a gun. You like, is that the kind of uh, uh, you know uh, gracious uh, dialogue that you like to have with your political enemies? God. That was that was really obnoxious. That was actually a pretty fun segment. You should probably read the New Yorker more often. I think we'll get you a subscription. Expense it to the company. I'm not sure that that's necessary. I, I'm going back. I'm going back to uh, Newton Wellesley in three months for another X-ray. There'll be some new. There'll be some new issues there. And I, and I had to go through three issues before I found that one. It's like go, all, all magazines now suck so bad. I mean, even even to run across something like that, it require it's like finding a needle in a haystack. Eight four four five hundred forty two forty two. Officer Mark says spellbinding. Says Variety. Moving beyond words. Says NPR. I laughed. I cried. Says Officer Mark. Eight four four five hundred forty two forty two. I'm Howie Carr. 